So I think we will begin, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to the University of Ottawa for hosting this event. Hello, bonjour, my name is Georgina Jackson. I'm a judge of the Court of Appeal for Saskatchewan and I'm delighted and indeed honored to be hosting this event. Uh, as you know, the purpose of this uh, webinar is to launch a new book into the Canadian legal landscape, but this is not just any book. It's a book that attempts the Herculean task of providing some meaning and structure to the administrative law principles in five countries, Australia, Canada, England and Wales, Ireland and New Zealand. Few scholars could attempt such a Herculean task and do it with such a plum as Professor Paul Daly has. Professor Daly has studied, worked, and advised about administrative law in each of the mentioned countries, as well as in the United States. He has several books to his credit, including a number of book chapters. He's widely cited by the courts, particularly in Canada. Uh, his blog on administrative law is regularly consulted by judges and lawyers alike. And indeed, it was the first such blog cited by the Supreme Court of Canada. He has won uh, numerous awards and occupied positions reflective of his expertise. In addition to holding a doctorate and having written in all of these areas that I've mentioned, he's currently the chair in administrative law and governance at the University of Ottawa. It's his book that we launched today, Understanding Administrative Law in the Common Law World. It may be of interest to know, for you to know that this is the third such launch for this book. Similar events have taken, pl taken place in Ireland and Australia. Both of those events are available on YouTube, as I imagine this one will be as well. Uh, he will be followed by two commentators, expert legal scholars in their own right, Professor Mary Liston of the University of British Columbia and Professor Jacob Weinrib of Queen's University. I'll now briefly introduce these two professors before I call upon Professor Daly. Professor Liston is an associate professor at the Peter A. Allard School of Law, University of British Columbia. Her research focuses on public law broadly and administrative law in particular. And she received her doctorate, a combined doctorate in law and political science from the University of Toronto. She has participated in two leading case books as a as a co-author of Public Law, Cases Commentary and Analysis, and as a contributor to Administrative Law and Context. Her work, her work has been cited in uh, several precedential public law cases by the Supreme Court of Canada. Professor Weinrib is an Associate Professor at Queen's Faculty of Law. Before joining Queen's, he held a shirt postdoctoral fellowship at the New York University School of Law as a Global Hauser Research Fellow in the Center for Constitutional Transitions, and as a Dworkin Balls and Fellow in the Center for Law and Philosophy. He's the author of Dimensions of Dignity, the Theory and Practice of Modern Constitutional Law. He's currently working on two major projects, one involving the foundations of administrative law and a book entitled Proportionality, The Nightmare and the Noble Dream. As you will see, both of these scholars are ideally placed to offer commentary on Professor Daly's book. Now, with respect to some administrative details, uh, this web webinar um, has available to it approximately 90 minutes. We expect that each of our speakers uh, will address you for approximately 10 to 15 minutes, and then that we will leave time for questions. Si vous aimez écrire vos questions en français, N'hésitez pas de le faire, nous essayons de vous répondre dans la langue que vous avez choisie. You'll be able to place your 
your questions in the chat box in English and French, and we will either respond to them as part of the presentations or we will answer them during the question and comment period. And as I indicated, we hope to provide enough time to allow a sufficient exchange between the panelists and Professor Daly in the response to your questions. So with, with that, I'll call upon Professor Daly to lead us off. Thank you, merci. Et merci beaucoup, uh, Madame la Juge Jackson, uh, pour cette uh, introduction uh, uh, à la fois gentille et flatteur. Um, et merci aussi au Centre de droit public uh, d'avoir organisé cet événement, uh, ainsi que uh, les deux autres uh, aussi. Uh, J'en suis uh, très reconnaissant vers les, uh, les co-directeurs du Centre, uh, ma collègue uh, Vanessa McDonnell et uh, mon collègue uh, Terry Skolnick. So, um, let me start um, by telling you why uh, I wrote this book. Um, my goal, first and foremost, was to provide a readable framework, an entry point, if you will, to the world of judicial review of administrative action, which is often an intimidating subject for law students, uh, legal practitioners, and, dare I say it, even judges. Uh, it is a vast field which covers a variety of different legal rules and principles, which is often bewildering to uh, the outsider or the uninitiated. And I wanted to provide a uh, framework for understanding the subject better, how it all hangs together across all of these areas. Um, because judicial review of administrative action or, or administrative law for short uh, covers procedural fairness, it covers how institutions are established and make decisions, it covers review for reasonableness and deference, it covers the sorts of remedies that you might get if a decision is unlawful, uh, it covers the restrictions on remedies, why courts sometimes don't give you a remedy even though there was something wrong with the decision, it covers the scope of judicial review, to what exactly does the law of judicial review apply. Across these vast areas, which are typically studied in silos, or studied, argued about, talked about, discussed, decided in silos, it seemed to me, from my experience as a teacher and as a practitioner, that there's a high degree of commonality, in fact, across these diverse areas. There are common themes, principles, unifying forces, which ultimately I call values. And it seemed to me that it was very important, given rapid developments in administrative law over the last 50 years or so, to provide just this sort of a framework. For centuries, administrative law was organized around the so-called prerogative writs, certiorari, mandamus, and so on. But these prerogative writs were sidelined by a series of procedural reforms in the 1960s and 1970s. And from their cremation uh, rose a set of general principles of fairness and reasonableness. And understanding these principles and how they fit together seemed to me to be a worthwhile and important project, not only because it's important to understand the subject, but also it's important to defend the legitimacy of judges developing these general principles. It seemed to me that these general principles have been quite successful, they've been dynamic and responsive in answering challenges which have arisen in public administration. And I want to make the case uh, for the legitimacy of this body of principles and the legitimacy of what judges have been doing in developing them. So, my framework is comprised of four values. Um, the first value is individual self-realization. This is the idea that judges in deciding cases, developing doctrine, they should further individual autonomy and dignity. And put prosaically, judges should help people to plan their affairs and to be treated with concern and respect by governmental officials. Second value is good administration. Now, this is about judicial solicitude for the effective and efficient use of scarce administrative resources. Thirdly, 
electoral legitimacy. When formulating rules and principles of administrative law, judges should be attentive to the mandates of those who have run electoral gauntlets, whether they sit in legislative assemblies or municipalities, whether they pass laws or exercise adjudicative functions, judges should respect those mandates. And fourth and finally, decisional autonomy, the proposition that distinct bodies should fulfill distinct functions. These four values taken together, I say, provide an intelligible structure for the vast law of judicial review of administrative action across the diversity of areas that I mentioned. I should say that this framework is an interpretive framework. I'm not merely describing what judges have been doing. I am providing an understanding of what judges have been doing. I'm not interested as much in what judges have actually been saying or doing, uh, but how they should be understood to have been saying and doing the things they have done. So how does this framework function composed of the four values of individual self-realization, good administration, electoral legitimacy, and decisional autonomy? I think it functions in two principal ways. The first way it functions is in a complementary fashion. There are some areas where the values function in a complementary fashion. For example, the right to reasons in common law, I think, is a good example of the complementary interaction of the four values. The starting point is that there is no general common law duty to give reasons. Why is this the starting point? Well, I think it is because of a concern for good administration. Every administrative decision maker everywhere in the administrative state were obliged to give reasons for decision. It would gum up the works of public administration. But the exceptions to this starting point also sound in administrative law values. Where a decision is particularly important to an individual, reasons should be given. Individual self-realization. Where there is a statutory appeal, which has been provided for by a legislative assembly, reasons should be provided because otherwise the right of appeal would be nugatory. How can you appeal against a decision if no reasons have been given? And uh, in order to respect electoral legitimacy, the mandates of those who created the right of appeal, uh, reasons ought to be given. The last exception is based, I say, on decisional autonomy, and that is where reasons are necessary for a court to perform its reviewing function of assessing the lawfulness of an administrative decision. That's complementarity. Uh, you also have uh, situations where the values need to be brought into equipoise. They need to be harmonized or balanced. And for example, in the area of procedural fairness, we see a, a balance of this sort. If you were to push the logic of individual self-realization to its limits, you would have full trial type procedures before any administrative decision affecting rights, interests, privileges, and so on were taken. But we don't do that because it would defeat good administration uh, by imposing significant burdens on administrative decision makers. It would also compromise decisional autonomy because it would mean that administrative procedures resemble those of courts, they wouldn't be distinct. And, and so bringing the values into equipoise involves making compromises between the logic of individual self-realization and the demands of good administration and uh, decisional autonomy, and occasionally uh, electoral legitimacy. I would also say that across the diverse range of areas of administrative law, the traction of the four values tends to vary. And so in areas like the scope of judicial review, for example, which involves a highly contextual um, 
context-specific, case-specific analysis, uh, the values tend to play a direct role in determining whether a particular decision uh, should be subject to judicial review. Uh, whereas in areas like procedural fairness or substantive review, uh, deference and reasonableness and so on, the values tend to structure the area at a higher level of abstraction, having less influence in individual cases. I should also say something about the comparative nature of this project. As Justice Jackson mentioned, uh, it is about uh, Australia, Canada, England and Wales, New Zealand and Ireland. As you can tell from the accent, um, I have some personal experience of, uh, of, of learning, uh, teaching uh, and writing about law in Ireland um, and also in uh, these other jurisdictions. Uh, I lived and worked and studied uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, and I've also lived and studied uh, and worked, obviously, in Canada. And over the years, I've come to appreciate the foundations of uh, judicial review in Australia and New Zealand also. Uh, and it strikes me, it always struck me, that the, the core features uh, of judicial review of administrative action in these jurisdictions were very similar. By core features, I mean the core features that any lawyer in these systems would take to be uh, a, a feature of administrative law, whether it's institutional structures, procedural fairness, substantive review, and so on. And these core features are the target of my inquiry. Um, and in the end, I say uh, these four values provide an attractive uh, pan-commonwealth framework for administrative law by focusing on individual flourishing, by focusing also on the efficient attainment of statutory objectives by decision makers, by respecting the mandates of those who've run electoral gauntlets, and by ensuring that distinct bodies play distinct roles in our constitutional system, I say that administrative law uh, facilitates uh, the achievement of objectives uh, in a liberal democratic society is therefore a normatively attractive and legitimate body of law. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Daly. We'll now call upon Professor Liston. Hello, everyone. Uh, I echo the thanks to uh, Paul and Vanessa and the entire team at the Public Law Center at the University of Ottawa for inviting me to read and comment on Paul's new book. And I'm delighted to be part of this panel with Justice Jackson and Professor Weiner. Um, so uh, I congratulations, Paul, as Justice Jackson said, uh, this is a remarkable Herculean achievement. Um, although I imagine it felt more like Sisyphus at many <laughs> instances as you were working on this book. Um, I think you really have um, uh, set out in, uh, to do um, uh, a massive project and have attained it successfully. Uh, this book is understandable and comprehensible even to those outside of administrative law. I think it is successful in demonstrating that administrative law isn't, as one of my students put in their evaluations one year, uh, like working with uh, jello running through your hands as you attempt to apply the various principles in context, but maybe that's more of a comment on my teaching than on administrative law. And that there is an intelligible structure, at least to modern administrative law uh, that we can discern. And that's as a result, as Paul discusses in the book, uh, the important work of uh, judicial creativity, what he calls a judicial construction project, which has had a positive impact um, with respect to access to justice uh, and legality uh, in uh, the various jurisdictions that he's examined. And so we can look at that um, um, back to, as he does, the reforms, and at least in these jurisdictions in the 1960s and 70s, increasing access to justice, reducing the technicalities around access and remedies, the important expansion of procedural fairness in the 1970s, and in particular in 1979 in Canada, and um, the ability to judicially review all parts of the executive, even those that are monar uh, monarchical, uh, prerogative, political. Um, and so it's always a shock to my students to realize that 
we actually didn't have the rule of law really in relation to the executive branch until quite recent times. Uh, and so that in itself is a notable achievement in administrative law. Um, that desirable foundations exist uh, that justify this creativity. So this is not an illegitimate exercise of judicial power. Uh, and that um, all of this Paul brings together in, a, in an enormous translation exercise going across several jurisdictions. He calls himself a hunter gatherer. And I think he is going with a jurisprudential labor that I can't imagine. Uh, and as he uses the analogy, uh, he produces a very satisfying meal by the time you get to the end of the text. Um, so Paul, I hope I'm gonna fulfill my administrative law duty to hear and listen to you and your text uh, so that I have a grasp the basic points and that, um, and that my comments are fair and fully informed. So I'd like to talk about a couple of things. Uh, the first is to start with structure because that's one of the most important dimensions uh, of this text. Uh, and I've said this to uh, Paul and the others on the panel, that what this book presents is a thin structure for administrative law. And I assure to them all that this is not a criticism, um, not at all. Uh, in this area of law, uh, which is simultaneously so very old and so very new, especially in Canada, where we have an overhaul of it every 10 years, being able to comprehend a basic structure is really important. Uh, and so Paul has successfully presented um, some of the recurring essential features of administrative law across a family of like jurisdictions as Professor Jackson, as Paul himself has laid out, Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, uh, England, Wales. Uh, and this is a really remarkable achievement in itself. Um, he's been able to show us that uh, our legal principles have core content, uh, central values, uh, which underpin their operation and provide enormously uh, important content. And that all of this is important for the study of administrative law on its own, um, but clearly uh, in any uh, comparative uh, projects. And so this is uh, very important going forward in uh, the academic world. And so you can imagine this analysis expanding to include Hong Kong or Nigeria or South Africa or Israel or the United States, just to name a few other jurisdictions. Uh, we can imagine fruitful comparative analyses between administrative law in common law jurisdictions and in civilian jurisdictions, figuring out what is similar and what is different. Um, and uh, importantly, especially for Canada at this moment, it may help us see similar principles and values in customary law. And here I'm thinking of the emerging legal project of recognizing Indigenous legal orders. And so we might be working with an intuition that fairness and reasonableness and proportionality are embedded in human thinking about justice, about a sense of justice, about how we reason and about how we make judgments. Um, and so we have many future translation exercises that will build on the work that Paul has done in this book. He has, um, although he was too modest to mention uh, some of the content about through this canvassing, he's been able to show some important convergences uh, in uh, administrative law across these jurisdictions. I'm going to talk about a couple. Um, the first is the shift of the focus away from distracting discussions and determinations of jurisdiction. Um, and of course, in Canada, we've done away with that entirely as a result of the Vavilov decision. And I think we all agree here that that's been a good thing. Jurisdiction remains an important conceptual underpinning. In fact, that's what administrative law is about, but uh, in many respects, uh, but we don't need to uh, analyze it the way that we used to in the jurisprudence. The decline of categorical thinking, except for the troubling remainder of legislative exceptions, the rejection of technicalities, as I mentioned in the prerogative writs, that each of these jurisdictions relies on a contextual and flexible uh, approach to analyzing uh, disputes that arise, uh, claimants bring forward in administrative law, and they often uh, re uh, rely on the consistent application of frameworks or multifactorial tests. And so as Mr. Justice Binney said in Dunn's Merit, particularly in relation to the standard of review and reasonableness, all of this is a big tent with a lot of variables, and it's important that these uh, frameworks and tests uh, work to help manage all of the information that is part of an administrative law um, case. 
that he uh, discusses the trend to more intrusive judicial review. Uh, it's placed on a spectrum from more deferential to least deferential. Um, but we talk about judicial review, as he notes, in, in new terminology now, in the language of scope and intensity. Um, and so that requires a judicial sensitivity to the values of good administration, as Paul points out, uh, the uh, general personal interest in being treated and fairly by administrative decision makers, that where uh, individual interests, privileges, and rights are important and paramount, they justify more intensive scrutiny and possibly more searching remedies. Uh, and of course, the respect for uh, the, the demo democratic dimensions of our legal order, the public interest, the public good, all matters public. The emergence of a principle of proportionality in, in public law across many jurisdictions, and I know Professor Weiner was going to talk about that more, um, and how we see that in all dimensions of administrative law, that the more important a decision is, the more onerous procedural fairness must be, and, and may include cross-examination, disclosure, representation, and of course, the duty to give reasons. That the gravity of the consequences and the impact on the person's life uh, demands more reasonableness uh, and may narrow the range of reasonable outcomes as well. That the administrative state is under a duty uh, to provide justifications for its decisions and actions and illustrate and demonstrate that it is engaging in well thought out decision making. That there's transparency, although we aren't there yet, in when judges reweigh factors and values when they disagree with an administrative decision. Um, and so that's when an administrative decision maker gives disproportionate weight uh, or through uh, omission or over consideration of relevant factors and um, uh, other kinds of considerations. That fundamental rights are given their proper due by being given appropriate weight with, with the more fundamental, the more weight and having that gravitational pull on how the exercise of judicial review fun functions. And as he points out, the merging of concepts of reasonableness and proportionality in many jurisdictions. And of course, we've seen that uh, most fully in the Doré decision. Another convergence is that we see that the exceptions around the duty to give uh, reasons are narrowing. And so it may be becoming uh, almost a near general duty uh, or practice at common law to uh, demand reasons or to have reasons as part of judicial review. I, I of course, am a of a proponent of a general duty to give uh, reasons at common law. Uh, and so for me, that is happy news to see that uh, across jurisdictions. Uh, that whether or not it's on the face uh, or um, it's sort of sublimated, um, that the deference principle, whether it's called deference or a margin of appreciation or room to maneuver, um, is, is present in all jurisdictions with Canada probably, as Paul says, being the most overt about engaging with the principle of deference in judicial review. And again, that's guided by a sense of proportionality, uh, that the degree of intrusion or scrutiny must be proportionate to the objectives that must be served in uh, a judicial review, guided by context, flexible to context, and justified by the judges themselves. Um, that common law courts uh, require decision makers to deliver reasoned decisions. And so in a footnote, Paul talks about a case, um, uh, ex parte Smith, our Minister of Defense, uh, which was a form of Wednesbury review. And he says of that case, um, that in that case, a court may conclude that a decision infringes an individual's human rights, is incoherent, lacks adequate justification, but it is not unlawful. And I, I think I would be very happy to say that we would no longer say that anymore in Canada. That, that could not be a lawful decision. Uh, and in many jurisdictions, that, that narrowing, at least of a kind of super wedding, very, very, very highly deferential form of judicial review uh, is no longer possible. And that is good news for legality and the rule of law. And um, I may say more about this later, but there is a, 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 an ever present sort of, um, I call it subconstitutional, but it's probably fair to say that it's the constitutional nature of administrative law that is uh, emerging uh, and being realized across jurisdictions, that it's not just the written constitution. Administrative law is a form of constitutional law. So this thin structure 
which is an important structure as I've laid it out. I think these are really important uh, demonstrable conclusions to have reached. Um, lead me to reflect on the desire of uh, why we might want a deeper structure. Um, and, and this is a different interaction with the book. And so thinking about the four uh, values, I was intrigued that Paul disclosed in the book that he originally had four different <laughs> values, uh, rule of law, good administration, democracy, and separation of powers, but they were all fraught with a lot of uh, disputes and normative <laughs> problems. <laughs> Although I thought they sounded pretty good. Uh, and instead he has his bespoke values, um, which um, I assume are all ranked equally. And uh, we also assume that they are discussed in, in the backdrop of a conventional liberal democratic state. And those two um, uh, uh, parts of my observation are important and I'm gonna to return to them. Um, that these values, and I'm, I'm intrigued why, why Paul chose values and not principles. So um, this is not quite a Dworkinian exercise in administrative law. Um, but even these values have a gravitational pull that parallels the gravitational pull of principles, or that's one of Paul's claims. And so that, that is what he's attempting to demonstrate. And that these these sorry values are founded in decided cases, written legal sources, so that as he says in the text, they are legal values of, quote, unimpeachable validity. So they are unimpeachable because Paul claims they are not political. And Paul says political here means they don't come from judges' personal preferences. But I'm more of a Dworkinian. And so I say they are political and they must be political, but they're not political in that sense. They're part of the larger backdrop of a political morality that's part of a liberal democratic state. Uh, so that's a minor quibble, but that's how I understand principles and values in that other framework. The four values, I wanna say, um, and how much time do I have Justice Jackson? You know, you have approached your 15 minute mark. We have we have a great deal of time and there are no questions yet in the chat box. So uh, take your time to finish your thoughts, please. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave my conclusion then and leave some of the detail for a discussion. Um, Paul claims uh, in relation to these four principles, and again, they're, they're, the, the values are uh, expressed in a, in a sort of ideal type and again, thin sense. Uh, and he says that um, neither, no, none of them are ranked, uh, they're all ranked equally, none of them can, you know, essentially trump the other. And in particular, neither individual right nor good administrative, uh, good administration reigns supreme. And I guess uh, I question uh, that. I suppose when it comes down to a choice between individual right and good administration, I will, I will choose individual right all the time and rank it with more priority because of the moral uh, dimension of, of being a human, uh, to me is more important than good administration. Uh, and that all of the sort of functional and um, practical uh, concerns that come with good administration to me are outweighed. Um, justice costs money. Um, but um, as my uh, parents told me when buying a winter coat, you buy the best you can at the time and it lasts uh, and that's a good investment. And so for me, when I'm thinking about uh, the ranking, um, it is the individual self-realization <laughs> that is number one. Uh, and you do list that first. So I wonder if implicitly, and at several points in your text, you seem to indicate that, but not as a major claim. Um, I won't say too much because I know I wanna give lots of time for Professor Weinrib too. But one thing I will say is that individual self-realization you generally define as, as the ability to plan your affairs. Um, and yet in other parts of the text, it includes autonomy, dignity, humanity, liberty, respect, integrity, rationality, and the requirement to deal with people humanely. And all of those are conceptually quite distinct. Uh, and so I do question, I, uh, when, I, when you first used individual self-realization, I actually thought you were kind of doing a version of the Martha Nussbaum and Marcia Senate capabilities approach, about what, what, you know, sort of what it means to be human and what we need in order to live a decent human life. And uh, obviously uh, it's a big package of things. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's where, uh, it inspires in me a desire to go to a deeper structure 
in order to understand uh, the moral requirements of law with respect to people who have been mistreated by the state and they could be corporations, but they could also be individuals. Um, and so I, I'm going to leave it at that, um, but I have a few other, uh, so I wanna do turn it over to Professor uh, Weiner, but I do have again, um, some um, comments on the ideal type of good administration and why we wanna be careful with that value. Uh, the, the thin version of electoral legitimacy, which you're very careful not to conflate, conflate with a very substantive conception of democracy. And, and that actually uh, is important and decisional autonomy. And, and that's where I think that value very clearly captures the tensions between the decisional autonomy of the administrative decision maker, as well as the decisional autonomy of the reviewing court. And, and that one to me uh, makes a lot of sense. And I, I don't have any sub comments for that one, but I wanna stop, uh, I'm a little over time, uh, and I hope we can return to some of uh, the deeper uh, um, structure issues, uh, both through Professor Weinrad's comments and in the question and answer. Thank you, Professor Liston. And we certainly will have time to return to those other questions. On the, I will now call upon Professor Weinrib, please. Thanks very, very much for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to talk that such a thoughtful book. Academic accounts of administrative law have, you rep have a reputation that is both horrible and very well deserved. They're known for endlessly heaping one granular technicality upon another. They're known for a parochial tendency to avoid any form of meaningful comparative engagement. And they're known for a very strong allergy to any kind of overarching principle by which one could find one's way through the thicket of details that they produce. Professor Daly's book makes a decisive break from each of these very unfortunate tendencies. His aim is to show that beneath the law's complexity is an intelligible structure, and that this structure is extraordinarily simple. It consists in the imperative to realize four potentially conflicting values. Okay, more on that in a moment. It's so simple, in fact, that last night over dinner, I was talking about the book with my seven-year-old, and we got out the introduction, and we tried to capture the whole argument in a haiku. Do you wanna hear it? Okay, here's the haiku. Four values, one law, balance your conflicts away, values reconciled. That's it. It's so incredibly simple. And this simple structure, he claims, illuminates administrative law in whole and in part, and it does so in each of the jurisdictions that he explores. The book is refreshing, it's ambitious, and it's deeply, deeply illuminating. Now, I want to say something critical about this very thoughtful book, because it's the way of academics to um, criticize, uh, provide significant criticism for whatever they think is significant. So I want to focus on the intelligible structure that Daly attributes to administrative law. And I'm incredibly sympathetic to his claim that administrative law must have an intelligible structure but I have some concerns about the kind of structure that he develops. So let me say something about what that structure is and why I have concerns about it. Daly's organizing idea is that administrative law is best under understood, not in terms of a single overarching value, but in terms of a plurality of values that inhere in the practice of administrative law. Um, as we've heard, these values include individual self-realization or what we might call dignity, good or effective administration, electoral legitimacy, and what he calls decisional autonomy. If these are the values, what does administrative law do with them? Daly's answer, once again, is very simple. Administrative law must realize these values in the very domains of its operation. In some cases, let's call them easy cases, um, these values will pull in the same direction. But in hard cases, the values will pull in different directions with the result that each value cannot be realized undiminished. And in these cases, Daly's claim is that administrative law, as practiced, reconciles the conflicting values by engaging in balancing. Now, we all know that in public law, the word balancing refers to a whole host of different ideas. And Daly doesn't say very much about what he means by balancing, but he says enough to make it clear that when values are balanced, one, no value reigns supreme, as, as Mary noted a moment ago, two, no value enjoys priority over any other. And 
Third, no value is expendable. Okay, so this provides a rough and ready conception of balancing. When administrative law confronts us with conflicting values, we do not place the values in a hierarchy in which one value might be eviscerated in order to further another. Instead, the suggestion is, conflicting values must be reconciled through a balance that ensures each is, as Daly puts it, accommodated to the extent possible. Taking these ideas together, Professor Daly conceives of administrative law as pluralist in one respect and unified in another. It's pluralist because it involves the interplay of four discrete values. It's unified because it is animated by the idea that each of these values must be preserved. This combination of plurality and unity forms administrative law's intelligible structure. Now, what concerns me about Daly's very uh, elaborate and interesting framework here, um, it's not the claim that administrative law has an intelligible structure. It must, it has to, unless everyone who practices and studies it and teaches it proceeds on the basis of having no idea what they're doing. It has to have some structure. And it's true that administrative law resolves some conflicts through balancing. But I think it's also the case that it doesn't always resolve conflicting values through balancing. And this suggests that it's not yet time to call off the search for administrative law's intelligible structure. To see this, think for a moment about how the law of procedural fairness is structured. The law distinguishes between threshold on the one hand, which concerns whether one is entitled to fair process, and content, which concerns the kinds of processes that fairness demands in different contexts. Now, Daly's account of balancing fits Canada's approach to the content of procedural fairness perfectly. Recall that that area of law determines the kinds of procedural protections that persons are entitled to by considering different values, including the dignity of the individual and concerns about effective administration. Certain values will, depending on their significance in a given context, weigh more heavily in the balance and therefore call for a more or less stringent set of procedures. And that's just as Daly says it should be. Conflicts between values are to be resolved through a balance in which the weight of each value is assessed and none is abandoned. So far, so good. Round one for <laughs> Professor Daly. However, when one turns from the content of procedural fairness to threshold, so from content to threshold, one is confronted by an entirely different kind of structure. The basic idea governing threshold is that anyone whose rights, privileges, or interests are impacted by an administrative decision has a right to a fair process, subject to certain exceptions. Now, this right is presumptive. It persists unless it is rebutted by an explicit legislative act. Now, suppose the legislature rebuts the presumption by explicitly excluding a fair process. Here we have conflicting values. Dignity or self-realization demands a fair process and the value of electoral legitimacy or perhaps good governance or both denies it. So how is this conflict to be resolved? Here, one would expect daily to rely on this conception of balancing and insist that no value has priority over any other and that each must be reconciled with every other. Um, that is after all, the kind of intelligible structure that he attributes to the whole of administrative law. But when it comes to threshold, of course, the law doesn't work that way. And daily is of course aware of that. He recognizes that the law imposes an all or nothing structure in which the value of dignity is not reconciled. It persists undiminished or is ousted by a value that enjoys priority over it. And so it seems that balancing as, as Daly conceives of it resolves the clash of values in some areas of administrative law and not in others. But if that's the case, then Daly's intelligible structure doesn't animate the whole of administrative law after all. This isn't a problem about procedural fairness. It's a problem that arises wherever administrative law resolves the clash of values through common law presumptions rather than balancing. So consider a substantive presumption. And here I'm going to refer to one expounded by Canada's greatest judge and Canada's greatest case. And that of course is Justice Rand and Ron Corelli. He states, no legislative act can without express language be taken to contemplate an unlimited arbitrary power exercisable for any purpose. Again, note the presumptive structure here. 
Administrative officials may not cancel a liquor license for a reason extrinsic to liquor regulation because they don't like the color of your hair or your religion. But as Justice Rand makes clear, if the law expressly authorizes such a power, the presumption is rebutted and the constraint imposed by this dignitarian value on the arbitrary exercise of discretion, well, that constraint simply dissolves. The value is not preserved and reconciled as Daly's intelligible structure demands. Instead, the value is simply ousted. So here's the crucial point. Balancing and presumptions have different structures. Balancing, as Daly presents it, has a realize this and also realize that structure. Realize this and also realize that structure. In contrast, a presumption has a realize this unless that structure. Realize this unless that. Balancing preserves competing values. Presumptions recognize the power of the, uh, one value to force another from the field. Accordingly, the intelligible structure that daily attributes to administrative law is at variance with any doctrine in administrative law that has a presumptive structure. If this is correct, then the intelligible structure that traverses the whole of administrative law remains unarticulated. Now, I've said something about how incredible I think this book is. I've said something critical. And now I wanna say something about how we might try to recapture the idea of an intelligible structure without losing um, uh, Professor Daly's um, significant insights here. So one option would be to proceed by way of an accommodation, right? To accept that balancing captures the structure of administrative law in some domains, but not in others. And now things are gonna become a little more complex, right? a little, they're gonna defy haiku. So if the, uh, if the structure, the intelligible structure of administrative law is to be expounded, we need now not only a theory of how to balance, we also need a theory of when to balance. We need a coherent, compatible theory of when not to balance. And we need a theory of what to do on those occasions when balancing is inappropriate. This I think would keep many of Professor Daly's insights developed in the book, but the resulting structure would actually be far, far more complex. There's another way one could respond. One could elasticize the meaning of balancing, stipulating that it means different things in different contexts. In some contexts, content of procedural fairness, balancing means that each value must be preserved and none is expendable. In other contexts, content of procedural fairness, wherever there's a presumption, sorry, a threshold of procedural fairness or wherever there's a presumption. Balancing may refer to an operation in which one value excludes another. And at times this seems to be the path that Daly wants to follow, for example, in his discussions of procedural fairness. But this path is dangerous for his purposes because if the notion of balancing is diluted to the point where it bears both the meaning that Daly attributes to it, preserve all the values, and the opposite of that meaning, some values can be ousted by others, Daly can neither claim that his account is coherent nor that it guides the principal development of the law. And since these are claims that his book makes, this actually seems like an unpromising way to go. A final response would insist that every conflict of values should be resolved through balancing as Daly conceives of it. To the extent that presumptions depart from balancing, you might say so much the worse for presumptions. They fail to exhibit the intelligible structure of administrative law. Of course, the difficulty here is that administrative law is replete with presumptions. Presumptions seem to arise whenever administrative law structures the interaction between common law norms that protect the dignity of persons and exceptions to those norms imposed by statute. And here the worry is that Professor Daly is providing an interpretive account of the law. He's not providing an account of what administrative law should be, all things considered, but an account that's actually true to what lawyers know about their own subject matter. Daly's important book forces us to come to grips with an important question. If administrative law has an intelligible structure, what is it? I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Weinrib. So now the, the way we have structured the webinars is Professor Daly is going to have an opportunity to respond to the two commentators. Uh, following that, then uh, we'll uh, take the questions from the chat box.
or I will have questions and I'm sure the other panelists will too. So with that, uh, Professor Daly, over to you again, please. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both uh, very much um, for those uh, excellent, um, excellent comments. Um, I am um, going to try to make uh, three points, um, I think. Um, you'll see I wasn't provided with the comments in advance, um, so I'm, um, I have to develop my responses on the fly. Um, but I, I think I'm going to have three points. Um, so the first um, picks up on something that uh, that Mary said about the move away from jurisdiction. Um, and indeed, there has been a move away uh, in Canada from concepts like jurisdiction as the organizing principles of uh, judicial review of administrative action. Um, but I think Canada is somewhat further along than other jurisdictions in that regard. And one of the interesting things about this project, which was a couple of book chapters and, and articles uh, before, it, uh, before it turned into a book, one of the interesting things was that, um, whereas readers from England or Australia would often think uh, Daly was going too far by uh, abandoning conceptualism in favor of values, uh, readers in Canada think Daly isn't going far enough uh, because uh, values already permeate the law to such an extent that uh, it's second nature to be thinking uh, in those terms. Um, and uh, so that's, um, I, 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 I note that um, perhaps the, uh, the, reaction, uh, the reaction here uh, speaks to uh, different expectations which uh, different um, scholarly communities might have about work uh, in this area um, and the battles uh, that have to be won um, in uh, in England and Australia against conceptualism um, have uh, don't need to be fought uh, in Canada. Um, I would say though that uh, certainly in the, the UK Supreme Court there has been a resurgence of uh, conceptualism um, in in recent years, particularly under Lord Reed's leadership of the Supreme Court. Uh, so there's uh, still work to be done, I think, in persuading uh, English administrative lawyers that um, values are more valuable than concepts as organizing principles. Uh, the second point um, to to discuss is the um, uh, relates to uh, values, uh, what values are. Um, so uh, Mary uh, says, well, why say values rather than principles and, and why change the values? Well, the first thing I should say in relation to the values is that in the earlier iterations of this work, I was using um, the, uh, the, the terms rule of law, good administration, uh, democracy, and separation of powers. Uh, but really, those are only labels um, for the same substantive content, such as it is. Um, and my, uh, the, the reaction was that these concepts come freighted with quite a lot of baggage um, in different jurisdictions and uh, you know, uh, philosophical or moral baggage in some cases. Uh, so that's why I, I switched the, the labels. Um, now, why values rather than principles? Well, I did want to uh, disassociate myself at least somewhat from, uh, from Ronald Dworkin. Um, and the reason is that uh, Dworkin says, and I think Mary uh, would agree, that the role of the interpreter is to provide, is to paint the law in its best possible light, um, provide the better answer, all things considered, uh, to any question, the one that best fits the, the moral and the moral commitments of the political community. Um, I'm not quite going that far. Um, I say that administrative law has recognizably moral foundations, not that these are the, the only possible or the best possible uh, moral foundations. Um, and I'm not saying that the law has to have these particular uh, characteristics, uh, though as, as Jacob notes, I am saying that they should, uh, the courts should balance. 
as to to balancing and presumptions, um, which uh, is a, a a critique which is uh, well made and well taken. Um, I agree uh, with Jacob uh, Jacob's exposition of my balancing exercise as having uh, first the uh, proposition as involving first the proposition no value is supreme uh, that there's no ranking between them and that uh, no value is expendable except those three uh, but I would also add a, a, a very important fourth um, which I, I, I think I particularly make in, in chapter nine. Uh, which is that the balancing has to be conducted in, in concrete situations. And so in respect of the, the presumptions, um, what I would say is that when we look, for example, at the issue of legislative ouster of procedural fairness, what we find in concrete cases is uh, either A, uh, the proposition that the legislative ouster must be, in scare quotes, clear, uh, or a very searching judicial analysis of whether uh, legislative ouster has occurred. Um, and I think that is where, uh, that, that's the outcome of the balancing, uh, the insistence on clarity and the reality that clarity is hardly ever uh, present. And to the extent that clarity, to the extent that uh, courts ever find that uh, procedural fairness has been ousted uh, at a particular point, uh, it is, I'm going to say, almost invariably the case that there has been some process uh, leading up to that point, which does engage uh, the value of, of individual self-realization uh, to, uh, to some extent. I'd also say, um, I mean, there are some presumptions um, where well, I would say the values are baked in and there is no uh, in, in a way which is, is consistent with, um, um, uh, with with my approach to to intelligible structure so the rule against fettering discretion for example um, the pro the principal proposition there is that a decision maker can adopt an inflexible rule um, that's a presumption but it's subject to the 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 subject to uh, giving an individual, uh, giving the individual something uh, to say about whether the rule should be modified or departed from in an individual case. Um, so I, I, I take the point that presumptions uh, might create a challenge, um, but I think when we add the uh, the, the concreteness requirement uh, to the mix, uh, as it were, uh, I think. Um, the, um, I, I think uh, we can see balancing going on even in those uh, harder cases, uh, as you uh, as you put it. Um, the the last point I would make, I think, relates to something which is a constant preoccupation of anyone who's uh, trying to do uh, interpretive work, and that's the uh, requirement uh, of satisfying. Uh, the, the constraint of fit and justification. So on, on one level, the uh, the cases have to fit, or sorry, the, the principles or values have to fit the materials. And on another level, they have to be uh, justified. Um, and the decision as to the, the the level of thinness or thickness that one uh, that one sets out. Uh, is uh, often a decision which is dictated by how much weight is given to fit versus justification. And the more uh, one is interested in justification and the more one is uh, a strong form Dworkinian who is interested in providing the best possible reading of the materials in light of what the interpreter takes to be the moral commitments of the political community, uh, the more the, uh, the interpreter is going to rely on deeper values uh, which might uh, cause the uh, which might cause legal principles, legal rules to be uh, called into question. Um, I think I'm um, more on the the fit side of the uh, of the spectrum uh, than I am on the the justification side. Um, so with that, I think um, I'll close my uh, 
I close my response. I, I suppose I should say uh, that is perhaps um, uh, an answer, um, if an answer is possible, to uh, to Mary's point about individual self-realization being so large and containing multitudes. Um, and uh, as we know, uh, the um, uh, as Whitman uh, advised, um, you know, um, so so what? Uh, I am large. I contain multitudes. There may be some contradictions. Um, if there were contradictions, uh, I would be worried, um, and I, I, I appreciate that I'm using individual self-realization in a in a very kind of sweeping way. Um, uh, absolutely um, guilty as charged. Um, and I would be worried if there were instances where the different aspects of it uh, that you've identified were coming into conflict. Um, but I, I wasn't persuaded that there, uh, there is uh, conflict of that, uh, of that nature. Um, and so that's that's why I, um, I, I, I took a, an approach which might seem a little bit uh, uh, free form um, uh, to, to uh, defining the content of that one. Thank you, Professor Daly. I see that there are at least three questions in the chat box I, and they are somewhat related. So I think I will read them all and then I'll ask you to comment on those first, Professor Daly, and then see whether or not our two commentators also would like to add something. They're all good questions, very good questions. The first with respect to the comparative part of your work for this book, Professor Daly, could you please share your thoughts on if and how written constitutions influence the values you've described? And the second is uh, something that's addressed in your book and that the three of us spoke about briefly yesterday is the pushback in some jurisdictions like Australia and the United Kingdom where governments are looking at legislating restraints on judicial review. Um, emphasizing parliamentary sovereignty and democracy, uh, and thereby having a greater focus on de democratic legitimacy and expediency. And again, asking for your comments, to what degree do you think that the difference on the hierarchy of values is it different in Canada, where we have a written constitution with human rights, personal dignity rights as a focus? And finally, uh, um, another, uh, a uh, participant asks us to look at administrative law values versus charter values and balancing. Is there a gradual convergence between administrative law and charter interpretation? To what extent is charter jurisprudence guiding the evolution of administrative law and vice, vice versa, perhaps, particularly the value of promoting human dignity? Um, so as to the um, as to the comparative point and written constitutions, um, let me it might be a bit late to um, to be adding this writer, um, but um, you know I'm not offering a a, a unified field theory um, of the subject. I mean, obviously it's it's uh, it's an ambitious. Project um, as the uh, as the commentators and Justice Jackson have been um, so kind uh, to point out, um, but it's also uh, it, it's a limited project in the sense that I'm just looking at the core features uh, of these uh, of these different areas. Um, I'm not providing a, a theory uh, of adjudication, and I, I do make clear that you you may be a judge in a particular jurisdiction, uh, may be constrained by by precedent or by uh, constitutional provisions uh, in a particular in a particular way. And so, um, the an in answer to your your question about whether written constitutions make a difference, uh, I think the answer is sometimes a lot and sometimes a little. Um, the in Australia. Uh, the distinction between judicial, executive, uh, well, especially judicial and executive power, which is a feature of the Australian constitution, has had a significant influence on the, the evolution of administrative law um, and would have, uh, I, you know, I don't think it's open to an Australian judge to break down the, 
legality merits distinction that uh, is a part of that, con that, that country's constitutional framework. So uh, sometimes um, administ uh, constitutions can be significant. Um, be significant. Uh, in other contexts, however, uh, constitutions are are less significant and they have uh, little influence rather than a lot. And Ireland uh, is an example of that, I, I think, um, in many respects, not, not uh, in all respects, but in many respects, uh, this is true of Ireland. Uh, Ireland has uh, constitutionalized procedural fairness. It's called constitutional justice. Um, but it doesn't make a difference in practice. Uh, it's the uh, it's same thing as um, uh, as uh, common law procedural fairness uh, subject, I suppose, and this goes back to, to Jacob's point about legislative ouster, uh, that if, if procedural fairness is constitutionalized, then legislation which ousts procedural fairness is unconstitutional. But you end up getting, uh, I think, to the, uh, the same place anyway, uh, through a process of, um, of uh, balancing in concrete cases, uh, as you, you also tend to do, uh, now that I'm uh, now that I'm on the theme uh, of uh, with privative clauses, um, which get read down to such a point that um, they are uh, they do not oust uh, the oversight role of the courts. Uh, again, in Ireland, uh, leg, uh, ouster clauses, privative clauses, are unconstitutional um, uh, because of the uh, the constitutional uh, the demands of the constitution. But the, the Irish position. Um, is, uh, I argue, uh, indistinguishable from uh, that which pertains in the other jurisdictions. Um, so uh, in answer to that question, uh, a lot uh, and sometimes um, a little. As to the um, continuing on the theme of uh, judges uh, in interpreting their way around um, uh, legislative prohibitions, uh, which is the, the next question, um, about the, uh, the, the clampdowns on judicial review in, in England and Australia. Uh, one of the remarkable features uh, of the clampdowns on judicial review in Australia uh, is that it has actually prompted the courts to expand judicial review rather than to uh, contract it. And they've had to the judges developed new concepts such as legal unreasonableness uh, to get around uh, legislative prohibitions on reviewing decisions, uh, in particular in the area of immigration. Um, so judges even faced with legislative, uh, what looked like clear legislative language, um, nonetheless found a way to vindicate uh, individual self-realization and, um, and electoral legitimacy too, to the extent that uh, those ouster clauses sought to uh, insulate violations of the law by executive uh, officials. Um, I think I've probably answered uh, for long enough um, um, those questions, um, and uh, I think perhaps Mary and Jacob might want to uh, to take them up um, and perhaps uh, take me to task uh, for some of my uh, for some of my comments uh, since I've had the floor. So I'll start with you, Professor Weinrib. Do you want to weigh in on one of those? Uh, uh, three questions or an aspect of one or more? I think the questions are actually tremendously important. Um, one thing they point out, as, um, as Paul noted, is that the elevation of common law presumptions to a constitutional status preclude legislative ouster, although, as we know, constitutional rights are subject to a kind of proportionality analysis, but they would require then not simply, um, you know, if we were to follow this idea that uh, Dr. Liston was elaborating about constitutionalizing common law norms, it wouldn't be sufficient, of course, for legislation to oust what had been common law rules by being explicit. As you know, prescribed by law is just one requirement of the proportionality analysis. And so there can actually be a very meaningful, meaningful difference between a regime in which um, these rights are held at common law in which these rights have constitutional status, quite apart right, from how often we have a legislative ouster in a common law regime. There's a certain security in knowing that certain rights cannot be ousted and in knowing that there's accountability if the government actually tries. And that accountability is constitutional in strength. Legislation yields to it. Um, it doesn't yield to legislation. 
can I also just say one thing about um, presumptions and then I promise I'll stop talking about them. Okay, I'll, I'll just take 15 seconds. So Paul, I take your point that balancing has to be contextual, but, and I, I understand the ouster has to be clear and there's a searching analysis of whether the ouster is clear, but notice that these are conditions that have to be satisfied for there to be an ouster where what I was actually raising was whether an ouster is actually possible at all, given your more general views about balancing. That's all. Professor Liston, please. Thanks. I have a few responses um, and uh, they do relate to the questions. Uh, the, the first is, uh, as I said, thinking about a deeper structure, um, I think provides different readings of the values. Uh, and one of them is, uh, and I had asked Paul this in an earlier conversation, why didn't he include South Africa in his uh, comparative set where uh, aspects of administrative law have been constitutionalized, including the duty to give reasons. Uh, but that just brings us back to the sort of idea of structure and architecture. Um, and, uh, and so there is, I think, a convergence or, um, or an interaction between uh, the more formal constitution and administrative law. And Paul talks about this in his book in various places, but not all together. And we can see that in things like the constitutionality of the necessity of judicial review itself. Uh, so section 96, which Paul has written on, uh, the duty to consult and accommodate in relation to indigenous peoples. Uh, the, I think, growing sense that uh, at least adjudicative tribunals probably require more guarantees of independence than we currently give them in Canada, which is something the UK has embarked on, that certain administrative bodies are, have a constitutional dimension to them. And so we can think of something, and this is, uh, has been written on, the, like the Canadian Judicial uh, uh, Council. Uh, is certainly a, <laughs> has that aspect. Uh, and of course, uh, unwritten principles, say like democracy in relation to municipalities, that municipalities have such an odd place. So, so there's a very fruitful set of uh, conversations about that constitutional nature of administrative law and, and the values that inform both. Um, the other conversation though, is about a deeper reading um, in relation to some of the values Paul suggests, but also a deeper reading in relation to politics. And so one, I just wanna make two comments and then turn it back to the audience really, um, which is uh, the thin reading of good administration has a certain danger to it. Uh, uh, and so, um, um, we have a, Yes, a slight technical glitch here. We'll just wait for a moment to see whether or not it will resolve itself. Justice Jackson, while we're waiting for Dr. Liston to come back, maybe you would take another question from the Q&A. Sure, actually, I'm, what I'm going to do is I have a question I would like to, to ask in preparation for the next uh, question that's in the, the Q&A. Uh, Professor Daly, one of the things that struck me by your book was its utility both for the practicing bar and for the judiciary uh, to provide a framework, a way of looking at, at the case law. Uh, your use of these four values of uh, individual self-realization, good administration, electoral legitimacy, decisional autonomy, by getting rid of, in quotes, uh, other concepts which, which might carry, carry more baggage, you will allow the bar and the judiciary to look at uh, a group of cases uh, which seem disparate and reconcile them. So I, I wondered whether you could, uh, uh, for the sake of our audience, take one of the, one of the administrative law principles like say standing or exhaustion of uh, min law remedies and just work through um, um, as quickly as you're able how a member of the practicing bar might view uh, your notion of reconciliation with how they might present a case to the court or how a judge might then take those values and, and do the further reconciliation necessary to come 
to a decision in a particular case, please. I, I think I'll take um, uh, exhaustion, uh, Justice Jackson, um, um, as a uh, uh, as a, as an example. Uh, so we know uh, the exhaustion principle is that an individual must exhaust their uh, internal remedies before seeking judicial review. Um, and the general justification um, for um, for those for that starting point is that um, the administrative process is the best place to uh, work out any uh, issues that a person might have. So you respect the decisional autonomy of the administrative decision maker by letting them go first. There are also powerful reasons of good administration to allow the administrative decision maker to go first. They're more likely to be able to come to a swift and efficient resolution of the matter and having their views would be helpful if ever the matter ends up on judicial review. Um, and the principle of exhaustion can also uh, engage the principle of electoral, the value of electoral legitimacy um, where uh, there's a, an internal right of appeal. So if you have an appeal, uh, you should take up the appeal, which was provided for by uh, people with uh, an elect who have run the electoral gauntlet, you should uh, use that facility before seeking judicial review. But nonetheless, there are uh, there is an exception uh, to uh, to that principle, and where uh, the uh, appeal procedures are not uh, working particularly well, um, an individual may seek judicial review. So they uh, the value of individual self realization is protected by ensuring that individuals can seek. Uh, recourse uh, can seek judicial review uh, immediately uh, if uh, the administrative process is going to be inadequate to uh, to address their concerns. Um, and um, one high profile case uh, in Canada at the moment uh, turns on justice justice issue. It's the the case brought by uh, General uh, Fortin, who was the the head of the uh, the federal government's vaccine task force rollout until he was removed from that position because of uh, allegations of uh, historical uh, sexual abuse against him, and uh, he wanted to judicially review the uh, decision to terminate his um, his position, um, and was met with the response that he should go through the military grievance system. But the military grievance system has uh, backlogs of, uh, of many months, if not years, for dealing with that sort of, of complaint. Um, and uh, it's not clear that uh, that complaint system would give him the redress that judicial review would give. Um, so that's a case where uh, the values are uh, our front and centre uh, with the, the principle that he uh, he should exhaust his uh, internal remedies uh, to the fore, uh, but also the possibility that he can get before the court if he can demonstrate uh, that uh, he can't effectively um, um, uh, he can't effectively um, uh, make his case uh, internally. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Uh, Professor Liston, we we uh, cut you off in mid response there, the technical system did. Um, did you want to complete that thought? And then do you want to, to add anything or comment on, on what Professor Daly has just said regarding the utility in an actual uh, case where either lawyers or judges are trying to resolve uh, uh, the, the what seems to be disparate case law? Please. If we have time, I'm sorry, everyone, my internet just went kablooey for a minute. Um, so thank you for allowing me to finish my thought at least. Uh, I don't quite know what you heard, um, but I was again reflecting on a thin versus deeper uh, structure uh, uh, set of uh, considerations and, and also about the nature of politics and administrative law. Uh, and so uh, just uh, you know, I'm reminded that uh, that at least for effective, efficient, and good administration, uh, you need uh, a competent and devoted <laughs> political service, and that we're in the era of outsourcing, privatization, and cutbacks. And so, your account of good administration uh, 
um, rests on um, somewhat shaky real foundations um, unless we recommit to the idea of uh, a well-functioning uh, unified, I think, public service trained in value recognition, uh, constitutional duties, uh, and uh, some sense that they're part of what it, we think of as a reasonable state. Um, and then very quickly, I, I think, uh, I think of what I have to say about individual self-realization ties back to what you just said, Paul, at least I hope it does, which is one value you rarely talk about at all in this text, and you don't include it overtly in individual self-realization as a quality. So one of the great achievements of administrative law and public law in the modern era, I think, is to make people more equal with the state. And that's a huge normative commitment to be able to call the state to account and also to identify the kind of harm. And so when you phrase individual self-realization at various points as the ability to plan your affairs, that doesn't really describe the harm that Mavis Baker experienced at the hands of the Canadian state. And so that's where I think the account that you provided is open for supplementation and growth uh, through deeper theories that understand what it means to be disrespected, treated unequally, discriminated against, uh, the subject of arbitrary and abusive power, um, uh, what it means for the state to do wrong, to be unconstitutional, to be unreasonable, to be unfair. Uh, so it's not a challenge. It's just, I can see this as an in invitation to have, a, a, again, another deeper conversation, certainly with the Canadian case law on these, how these values work in, in situ in a real case. Thank you, Professor Liston. Did you want to make a comment on that comment? Uh, well, I'd say, yeah, I, I take the point about uh, relying more on autonomy than on, than on dignity, but I, I'd say that uh, uh, in Baker's case, uh, for sure, uh, it was dignity, which was, uh, which was at issue. Um, you're, you're right um, that, I, uh, that I sidelined uh, equality. Uh, another, um, I mean, you mentioned earlier, um, indigenous, uh, indigenous rights, uh, duty to consult uh, and so on. Um, it has been suggested, and I think uh, it's a reasonable suggestion, that uh, individual self-realization sometimes has a, a group aspect or communal aspect to it, um, which I don't, um, I don't uh, spend much, uh, much time on. Um, so absolutely, there's, uh, there's room for, uh, for further exploration there. And you know, I should say in general, I, mean, I mentioned earlier, I, I don't provide a, a unified field theory, uh, but I also wouldn't say that I'm, uh, I set out to have the last definitive final word uh, on these issues. Uh, what struck me as remarkable when I first started to think about this project quite some time ago, um, was that no one had attempted it, um, that uh, administrative law writers were still happy to, to treat these subjects as being uh, in silos. Um, public law theory or theory about administrative law is much less developed than theory about private law, uh, about tort and contract. Uh, in part, that's because the uh, the writ system was abolished in private law in the, the late 19th century. So the, the other guys, uh, the private lawyers have a hundred year head start on us because we only got rid of the prerogative writs 50 years ago. Um, but I think there is a significant scope for, uh, for more uh, general uh, theoretical work. And I'm, I, I'm surprised that, uh, that mine is really the only, uh, the only, I'm the only one who's either brave or foolish enough to have uh, to have attempted this, but it does seem to me to be uh, to be a field which is ripe for uh, further theoretical engagement and uh, seeking further depth uh, on these issues. Um, there are many articles, of course, by, by you, Mary, uh, and others uh, on uh, looking at the deep structure of particular areas uh, of administrative law, uh, but I think um, there is also scope for those treatments of particular areas to be expanded into, into book length treatments of the entire subject. And uh, I, I hope uh, such works are, uh, are forthcoming because this is a, a debate uh, and discussion that we, we should be having on a, on a regular basis, not just debating the, the minutiae of, um, of judicial review and, uh, and Vavilov and all its nooks and crannies. Um, the, these foundational issues are, are important and we should be uh, we should be discussing them more regularly than we discuss them.
Thank you. There is a, another uh, uh, question in the chat box. I think uh, that uh, Professor Weinrib is, uh, is uh, drafting an answer to that, but maybe what we'll do is uh, just ask for, for a, a quick oral response from you, Professor Weinrib. So the question is um, uh, about the balancing of values and, and the, the questioner acknowledges that, uh, that there has been uh, some discussion of that already, uh, but then makes the comment whether, whether in a case like Ocean Port Hotel, decisional autonomy just seems to fall away in the face of legislation to the contrary. And it, it's, it is this, uh, two questioners are trying to um, prompt a discussion about are there other values and this question of balancing. And one questioner is emphasizing legality. Professor Weinrup, could you take a stab at that before I will then go around and ask for Professor Liston and then Professor Daly for last comments before I thank everyone. Thank you. So, so the question about Oceanport is a really helpful one. So Oceanport is a case about um, the presumption of the procedural fairness entitlement to an impartial process. And uh, in Oceanport, the Supreme Court comes to the view that, well, um, this is just a common law uh, presumption, not a constitutional principle, and therefore it can be ousted by explicit legislation. And this legislation is explicit, uh, sufficiently explicit to oust. And I take it uh, that the question is sort of putting further pressure on this question of the relationship between competing values. Um, Oceanport is saying like, look, it's part of our um, dignity to be subject, uh, to, to be free of a partial decision in uh, the case of the, uh, in the, um, uh, with respect to these fines from, from violating the, uh, the uh, liquor regulations. And um, there, again, it's not a balancing of values. Where there's a common law presumption, it can be ousted by explicit legislation. And so it looks like this value of an impartial forum, which is integral to dignity, is not balanced and preserved, but balanced away, which is to say not balanced at all on Professor Daly's view. So by my clock, that leaves one minute uh, for you, Professor Liston, for a last comment and one minute for Professor Daly. I really only have one point following on the question and Jacob, which is um, there are some clues in, in Paul's book. Uh, in various places, he says there are some guarantees, uh, some principles that operate, the court seems to suggest, various courts seem to suggest operate autonomously of any statute, such as the right to be heard uh, in, in night from the Honor du Bay, uh, and the fundamental protection of, of uh, important interest to the individual, which seem to be clues about the constitutional nature of administrative law. And if we took it down to the studs, we might see a whole host of um, elements that uh, statutes are in real tension with if they try to oust. Uh, and that is a subject worth exploring, I think, a bit more. And a last word, Professor Daly. Well, I can only say thank you to, uh, to Jacob and Mary uh, and to you for, uh, for your contributions uh, and to the audience for their excellent questions. Uh, Ocean Port, um, I, uh, I'm not sure I could, uh, I, uh, not sure I could quite reconcile that. I might be able to, uh, by uh, relying on the, the adjudicative independence of individual decision makers, but I, I'm happy to accept that, that, that Ocean Port is a, uh, is a pretty tricky one uh, for me, uh, but thank you all. Um, and uh, thank you in particular, Jacob, for the, uh, the haiku. Um, I will see if my seven-year-old can come up with anything uh, comparable this evening. That's excellent. Uh, in the one minute before we, we must sign off, I want to thank uh, Andrew for his technical support, um, Ms. Ariani County for keeping us on time today, uh, the officials uh, with the public law unit at the University of Ottawa, particularly Professor McDonnell and Professor Skolnick, 
And of course, uh, to our commentators, professors Liston and Weinrib, and, and most of all, thank you very much, Professor Daly, for writing this book and adding to the Canadian scholarship. Thank you to our audience. Good day. Bye-bye.